Joe earlier, I'm at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado, and this is going to be a talk on, I'm going to try and keep it introductory, but hopefully cover all the main points of oil chemistry and transesterification. So uh, it's going to be, you know, we're talking about um, kind of getting under the hood a little bit. So, you know, if you've been making biodiesel, you kind of know what the recipe is. Hopefully this will, you know, get some more insight on why things behave the way they do. So. Uh, does, uh, does everybody here make biodiesel? Anybody familiar with the process at all? A yeah. couple, couple people have made biodiesel, so a couple of you haven't. Okay, um, great. Well, I'm going to start at the very, very beginning, and um, hopefully just you know let me know if this is too basic for you. But um, I'm going to start off with just, just, with just real basic chemistry. So elements are, you know, there's a lot of terminology here. So elements are the fundamental substances of what the universe is made of. So examples are like hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, things like that. There's a, they're all up on the periodic table, which is conveniently posted on the wall there. And that is the, you know, the smallest unit of a, of a material you get is an atom um, that can exist as an element. And that's what elements are made of. So atoms are the smallest particles, and they're defined by their atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons which exist in the nucleus of an atom of that element. Protons carry a positive charge, and there's also in the nucleus, there's neutrons, which are about the same size, but they don't carry any charge at all. The bulk of the mass of an atom is all in the nucleus, and surrounding that nucleus are things called electrons, which are negatively charged, and they're much, much smaller. So, so that's kind of the, you know, the you know, basic general chemistry. Now, in theory, the number of electrons in an atom is the same as the number of protons. However, this doesn't usually result in what we call a stable electron configuration. And just put real simply, they, electrons kind of, they like to exist in certain positions around an atom. And if they're not in those positions, you know, they're, you know it's, it, it requires a higher amount of energy in the atom to do that. So they like to be in these certain configurations. And you know, when they're not, it creates an instability, and that's the basis for the formation of bonds between different atoms, which form groups of atoms, which we call molecules. And a compound is just uh, distinct substances that's composed of molecules made of two or more elements. So example might be, would be carbon dioxide, which is composed of carbon and oxygen. Methane is carbon and hydrogen, and so forth and so forth. So, now a little bit more about chemical bonds. They result, like I said, due to the tendency for the atoms to exist in a low energy state. You know, it's kind of like water flows downhill. Well, energy in chemistry likes to flow down, downhill. Everything wants to go into this, in what's the lowest possible energy state. And for atoms, that means a stable electron configuration. There's two main types of bonds, uh, what we call covalent bonds, and that's where just electrons are shared between atoms. So if they, you know, if they say an atom needs one or more electrons to be in a stable configuration, well, if they can share a pair of electrons with another atom, then you know, they're both happy, they form a bond, they can form a molecule. Another type of bond is called an ionic, and that's actually where an electron jumps from one atom to another. And that creates a charge imbalance. So if an electron moves from one atom to another, the electron that it left is going to be now have a positive charge, and the electron and the atom that it went to is going to now have a negative charge. So then they're going to connect together because they have a, a charge imbalance. So an example of that would be sodium chloride, NaCl, that's common in table salt. So. Okay, so what happened here? I'm not sure. Um, okay, so chemical reactions are now the result of the rearranging of bonds to form different molecules. So a simple example of that is the oxidation of hydrogen. Uh, this is kind of like, you know, if you go to science fair, they got a balloon of hydrogen, pull a lighter under it, it explodes, right? Well, that's because the hydrogen is bonding with the oxygen, and you'll notice it has plus energy on there. Well, that forms water, but water has a much lower energy state than either of those two um, molecules together, so that energy is released, and that's called spontaneous reaction. Spontaneous reactions release energy. Most of the time, when we're you know, driving cars or burning fuel, um, that you know, oxidation process releases a lot of energy, so you get heat, which you can use to do work. Um, however, there are also chemical reactions that don't result in a significant change in the energy state between the, the reconfigurations. Those are called reversible reactions. 
they can kind of proceed in either direction. And why they proceed one direction versus another is going to be a big uh, part of this talk, and it's really important in making biodiesel. Most of the reactions we're dealing with in biodiesel are reversible reactions. And there's an example there, sodium carbonate. You know, it's just, you know, you have salt, calcium carbonate, you can go to sodium carbonate, calcium chloride, you know, and that can kind of go in either directions depending on the conditions. So. Okay, so now there's a thing in chemistry called stoichiometry, and that is because chemical reactions occur on a per atom basis. You know, you know, if you have two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen, that will make two molecules of water. Now note the total number of elements on each side are the same. So that you know you have this subscript here, that means you know hydrogen exists as two hydrogen atoms bonded together. So the first step is to balance that equation. First step to understand a chemical reaction is to balance that equation. And that gives you, allows you to know the relative amounts on a per atom basis of the different amount of substances required in a reaction. However, you know, we can't really count atoms. You know, they're really, really small. We measure things by mass or volume. So there needs to be a connection to number of atoms and the amount of mass. And there's a standard called Avogadro's number. Um, Six times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, it's a really big number, but that number of atoms is also called one mole of a substance. And these numbers here, there's two hydrogens to one oxygen, that's called a molar ratio in the, in the reaction. And um, the periodic table um, kind of helps connect that because um, how much mass is in one mole of a substance is connected to its molecular weight. For example, one mole of carbon is about 12 grams. One mole of sodium is about 23 grams. So if you have this amount that you can measure, carbon and sodium, you know that they have about the same number of atoms. So, and there's a picture of the periodic table. Can't do a talk about chemistry without showing that. Uh, it's also hung up on the wall over there. Um, and that's really a, a really important thing in chemistry. So now that we've got that covered, we can move on to organic chemistry, which is the branch of chemistry that deals with car compounds containing the element carbon. Now, there are many, many, many organic compounds because it's the basis of life on Earth, and there's lots and lots of different kinds, you know, organisms of life. It's very diverse. So about 90% of the known compounds that we deal with are in this category of organic compounds. Now, they're usually not very complicated in terms of the number of elements in it. It's usually carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. There's a few really key players. But what's important in organic chemistry is how they're arranged. You know, things like the shape, the types of bonds it's in. Organic compounds can be very, very large. And most of the chemical and physical properties associated, associated with them are related to this kind of structure they have. So that's very important in uh, organic chemistry. Um, organic compounds are organized into classes based on what we call functional groups, which are kind of you know, certain things that might be, you know, attached to one of the, you know, usually organic compounds, there's a carbon or a carbon chain, and then there's something else, like a functional group. So there's three main ones that we deal with in biodiesel, which are called alcohols, and they contain what's called a hydroxyl group. That's this, you know, oxygen and a hydrogen. Um, and this R in these diagrams just sort of stands for the rest. You know, and that could be, you know, this could just be uh, a single carbon, it could be 20 carbons, but it's just something that's really not important for what we're looking at right now. Because like I said, sometimes these things are really big and it would just be really unwieldy to always include, you know, the rest of the molecule. Uh, there's also carboxylic acid. That's what a uh, part of the free fatty acids you may have heard of. Those are carboxylic acid. They contain this carboxyl group, which is a carbon, it's a double bond to an oxygen, and a single bond to an oxygen, and then a hydrogen. Uh, and esters are alcohols, basically an alcohol plus a carboxylic acid. So they're, you know, if you combine those two, you get an ester. Okay, so a little more on fatty acid. It's a type of organic acid that contains a carboxyl group, like I said. They're not usually strong acids, but they do react with strong bases to form salts, which we call soap. So we'll get more into that later, but if you put lye, and fatty acids together, you get soap. But technically, that's a salt. Uh, it's just a type, you know, which is a certain type of salt we call soap. Um, 
Now the length, like I said before, the structure, the length of the carbon chain, the types of bonds it contains are very important in determining the physical properties of that fatty acid. Fatty acids are usually, they're very nonpolar. Um, and what, you know, without getting into too much detail what that means, it basically means they're, they're like oil. They don't mix well with water. Uh, they're not good solvents of most salts. And so now let's talk about saturation. So that, what saturation means is organic compounds have a lot of hydrogen. You know, fundamentally, there's a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen. So carbon can make up to four bonds with other atoms. Most, a lot of those bonds go to hydrogen. So what we mean by saturated fat means it has the maximum number of hydrogen that it can possibly have. And all the carbon to carbon bonds are just single bonds. So it's saturated with hydrogen, so to speak. So examples of that are palmitic acid, common to palm oil, stearic acid, which is common in pork fat, um, they're very stable. They're, they're the most stable fats um, in terms of chemically speaking. They don't break down as easily. Uh, so they're very highly desired in fat fryers and things because you can, you know, cook, cook with them very high temperature. They don't break down. They don't smoke, you know, as easily as some other fats. But they do have a higher melting point than unsaturated fats. So that is a problem with fuel, uh, especially in cold climates. So unsaturated fats, don't have the maximum number of hydrogen they could possibly contain. Um, and because of that, they have double bonds between some of the carbons. Now what that does is that leads to kind of a kink in the shape of the molecule. So if you've got 22 carbons in a line, and one there's a double bond in there, the molecule kind of physically bends, it changes shape. And so that causes them to, they don't kind of stack up as easily. And so they can, they have a lower melting point. They're liquid at a lower temperature because they don't, you know, in order to form a solid, you know, the molecules kind of have to stack together and crystallize, so to speak. So that's a good thing, you know, for, for a lot of us with, uh, when we want to use them as a, as a liquid fuel. However, those double bonds are susceptible to oxidation. You know, oxygen in the air can get in there and attack those bonds and form really nasty stuff that you, you know, you don't really want unless you're trying to varnish a fence or something like that. You know, like boiled linseed oil. It's a lot of unsaturated fat, a lot of double bonds, and you know, it, it dries, sort of. What's really happening is it's reacting with oxygen, turning into more like a plastic something, you know, not a, you know, oil. Okay, so, um, a little bit more about the nomenclature of fatty acid. Um, they are named based on the number of carbons and the number of double bonds. So usually there are about 16 to 22 carbons in the chain. Uh, most of the time there's about you know, zero in the case of saturated fat, up to maybe three uh, double bonds in an unsaturated fat. So there are trivial names and systematic names associated with each one. However, the systematic names sometimes can be really long and complicated. Now this linoleic acid uh, has two, two double bonds and I think it's uh, 18 carbons. Um, so the systematic name is this, you know, this long thing that kind of is unwieldy. So there's a lot of trivial names, you know, just used in industry and things like that. Um, you know, a lot of times this is based on, you know, maybe what plant they come from. You know, linoleic acid, linolenic, um, is associated with linseed oil. It's very common in the flax plant. So here's a couple of diagrams of what some of them look like. You know, here's the saturated fats. Um, here's some of the unsaturated fats. You can see they kind of have these kinks in them. So. All right, so moving on, any questions so far about <coughs> fatty acids and you guys completely lost? Are you following me a little bit? Thumbs up? Yeah, you don't need everything you just say, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we should have a one-on-one -on -one session. <laughs> okay. All right, so now let's talk about alcohols a little bit, because that's also what's important in biodiesel. So, Alcohols are a carbon chain that include one or more hydroxyl groups that have this OH, oxygen and hydrogen. Now, simple alcohols are probably the most common and the most relevant to what we're doing. You know, there's methanol, which is just one carbon. So you can see there's a, here's the carbon. Um, it's got four bonds, there's three hydrogens. And then this guy, the red guy is an oxygen. So there's a bond there and then there's one final hydrogen that's attached to the oxygen. Ethanol is very similar, except there's two carbons. So it's got just one extra carbon there. Now glycerol, or glycerin, um, is also an alcohol. It's a little bit more complex. It has three carbons. And 
nine, there's three carbons, but it also has three hydroxyl groups. Each carbon has one of these hydroxyl groups associated, attached to it. <coughs> so it's a little bit bigger of a volume. So now these alcohols, the ones that we're dealing with that are relevant in biodiesel, are strongly polar. These, uh, you know, this guy here, this oxygen, uh, it's kind of a big molecule, and so the electrons kind of spend more time around that. It kind of at, makes this a little bit of a, of a charge over there. So, you know, like as with water, water is the same way. Uh, water is, is oxygen and two hydrogens. So it kind of has a positive side and a negative side. That's what we call a polar molecule. So, you know, alcohols mix well with water. You know, they don't mix well with nonpolar molecules like oil and fatty acids. So. That's uh, something to be aware of. Okay, so, and then finally, esters are the result of bonding an organic acid with an alcohol. So both vegetable oil and what we call biodiesel are esters. They're just different types of esters. And therefore, the process of making biodiesel is called transesterification, you know, changing one ester to a different type of ester. Um, Here's a simple example, ethyl ethanoid. This is the alcohol part, so if you imagine that instead of going from here over, this is just a hydrogen that this oxygen is bonded to, this is ethanol. You, know, you don't show the carbons on here, but there's carbon there, carbon there, ethanol. Over here, this would have been um, an ethanoic acid. Um, so there's two carbons, but see it's got this double bond to another oxygen, and if this oxygen was bonded to a hydrogen instead of another carbon, this side of it would be a organic acid. So you can see how this oxygen kind of forms the bridge between the alcohol side and the organic acid side. And that makes an ester. So here's an example of vegetable oil. So vegetable oils are, we call them triglycerides because they are three fatty acids bonded to sort of a backbone of glycerol. So each of those sites in the glycerol where there would have been a hydroxyl group goes to another fatty acid. So they're rather large molecules. You can see they've got these, you know, fatty acids are pretty long, you know, 16 to 22 carbons long, and there's three of them, and here's the glycerin part. So pretty big. Okay, so transesterification. The simple version is you take one molecule of vegetable oil, three molecules of methanol, and you turn that into three methyl esters and one glycerol. So methyl ester is just, you know, basically what we're doing is you're exchanging the glycerol alcohol with a methanol. So methanol can only bond with one fatty acid because it only has one hydroxyl group associated with it. So you're kind of chopping up a large molecule into three smaller molecules and the cool thing about that is it, it's a, like I said, it's a reversible reaction. There's, there's not a lot of energy exchange there. It can kind of go either way. So the resulting methyl ester has about the same energy content in terms of you know, being able to burn it, use it for energy, as the vegetable oil did. But doing that process changes its properties and makes it less viscous, usually at a lower melting point, which makes it better for use as a fuel. So like I said, it's reversible, and that's a really important thing. Uh, they have the same energy content pretty much, but it's challenging because that can make it a little bit difficult to encourage the reaction to complete, because it can kind of go either way. So what we need to do is we need to create conditions under which it uh, will, we want to encourage it to go from the vegetable oil side to the mostly methyl esters side. Anybody know how I'm doing on time? Yeah, 20, 20 minutes left and 10 minutes for questions. Okay, cool. Uh, so usually, um, so the standard recipe we use calls for 100% excess methanol. So we're using twice as much methanol as you know would theoretically be need, needed according to the stoichiometry, uh, and also usually heat and some catalyst is required. So now let's take a little closer look at what actually happens when we try and do that. So there's kind of there's there's a few main things that happen. First, we're going to add a catalyst to methanol to form methoxide, and then we're going to react that methoxide with the triglyceride to form a methyl ester and a diglyceride anion. So we're chopping off one of the fatty acids, making a diglyceride, and then the catalyst gets regenerated, and then the process repeats. You know, so the diglyceride goes to a monoglyceride, the monoglyceride goes to a free glycerin. So that's kind of the order of how things happen. So let's look at each one of those little steps. So first. Now I'm approaching this from kind of a, you know, sort of a low tech, kind of a homebrew kind of approach. And this is how I made biodiesel and, and I've always made it. So 
you know, you can get lye, you can buy lye, it's relatively cheap, you know, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, you know, comes in a dry form, you mix it up with methanol, right? Okay, um, all is well and good. However, if you look at the actual reaction, we've got methanol plus lye, which is sodium hydroxide. It has a hydroxide group in there, right? Mm -hmm. So that splits up, and that tends to make this CH3O negative, that's methoxide. So it's sort of a more reactive form of methanol, but then you have these sodium ions floating around and water. So it's very important to notice that this, this when you mix lye and methanol, you make water. Basically, you know, you're splitting up that lye into sodium cations, which are the positively charged ones, and hydroxide anions. And those hydroxide um, can grab a proton, basically, off of the methanol and make water. So, uh, so that's really important to notice. Um, when using that as a catalyst. So then the next thing that happens is the methoxide, because it has this, it's sort of, you know, it's missing, you know, it has a negative charge, so it wants to associate with the proton. So it attacks one of these bonds. It goes in there and kind of, you know, hits this carbon here and, you know, breaks off a methyl ester and you're left now with the triglyceride anion. So now the negative charge is associated with the triglyceride instead of the methyl ester, right? So this guy's pretty stable, but this guy now really wants a proton to, to become, you know, you know, a, a stable molecule. So if it grabs a proton from another methanol, then you get another methoxide, right? So that's sort of how the catalyst procedure works. You know, then you're you're kind of regenerating this uh, methoxide, and and then now you have diglyceride, and then another methoxide can come in and attack another bond, and so forth and so forth and so forth. Do you have a question? I have a question that you may cover maybe too tangential, but you explained to us earlier that uh, uh, we've got this beautiful fatty acid, uh, and the fatty acid is what basically uh, the kinks or non kinks. Uh -huh. Why is it the case that as we increase the fatty acid count, this reaction doesn't seem to work reliable when you seem to have like an overabundance of material that you could actually convert? Does that make any sense at all? Uh, you mean fatty acids or oil? The distinction between the two. Okay, yeah, uh, I think I'll get to that. Okay. Uh, if you just wait, hold, wait. Okay, so, uh, next thing. Okay, so now if we want to optimize this reaction, um, it can proceed in either direction. You know, you can, you know, there's really no, there's not an obvious benefit as to why it would make methyl ester versus triglyceride. So, what we do is one thing we add a lot of excess methanol. So any time you have more product, more, more reactants, the left-hand side of the reaction, that's going to, because of equilibrium, it's going to tend to drive the reaction towards more methyl esters. So that's one way we do it. Um, another thing you notice that it's, uh, it's limited by mass transfer. You know, remember that oil and the methanol are not very soluble in each other. So it kind of exists as tiny drops of methanol and catalyst suspended in the oil. So we got to mix, we got to agitate, we got to get those drops as small as possible because it's, you know, the reaction time is limited to how quickly, you know, those two different things can interact with each other. So, okay, so now reaction inhibitors. There are two big side reactions that are bad. Okay, one is the, what we call hydrolysis of a triglyceride to form a carboxylic acid, a free fatty acid. And then the reaction of the catalyst with that carboxylic acid to form a soap. So hydrolysis is just like this. Instead of a methanol, you have water in here, and this can, you know, the water can replace one of these uh, uh, fatty acids to form a free fatty acid, the carboxylic acid, and diglyceride. Now this happens in deep fat fryers. You know, when you have a lot of heat, a lot of things moving around, uh, again, equilibrium. If there's a lot of oil and a little bit of water, you know, it's going to, the water's going to react with the oil. So that's why when you have bad oil, it tends to have a lot of uh, free fatty acids. So it can also happen in bodies of processing because the presence of a base catalyst will facilitate this reaction in a similar way that it facilitates transesterification. That's called saponification, which I'm going to get to in a second. Um, so again, you know, soaps are salts of alkali metals and free fatty acids. Um, the thing about soaps is they sort of have a polar side and a non-polar side, and they facilitate mixing between the two types of substances. In biodiesel, that leads to emulsification, which we all know is very bad probably dealt with that if you've ever tried to make biodiesel. Um, okay, so soap formation. If you just have lye and a free fatty acid, it makes soap and water. 
So, and that's a very straightforward reaction. So when you do your titration, you're making biodiesel, you know, this kind of process, you know, you add ex excess lye because the lye is very reactive with that free fatty acid. It'll just, you know, kind of take it up. And, you know, in the, in the common terminology, we call it neutralizing the free fatty acid. And uh, I think that's a little bit of a too benign way of saying it because really what we're doing is making soap out of those free fatty acids. And they're not really benign. They're not just neutral. They have their own properties which cause some problems. So saponification is kind of hydrolysis plus soap formation. So this might be a little too much going on in this slide, but it really kind of functions, you know, the mechanism is very similar. If you have a hydroxyl uh, ion, it can attack, you know, this is an ester here, can attack that bond, it's similar to the, what, the one I just had up with the methoxide. Um, but that, what ends up happening is it kicks off a free fatty acid instead of a different ester. So, and then, like I said, that free fatty acid is very reactive with catalysts. So this kind of, um, this is all well and good. You, know, you can see the product here is a free fatty acid and this is an alcohol. Uh, but then this free fatty acid is, um, you know, will ultimately lead to soap if you have catalysts around. So, so when we have saponification versus transesterification, like I just said, the, you know, the path, if you have hydroxide, it leads to um, a free fatty acid and alcohol transesterification. Instead of hydroxide, you have a methoxide, um, which kind of you can see here. This is that oxygen that wants to pick up a proton. Here's the oxygen that wants to pick up a proton. So they're kind of similar, but they, they, they result in different products. So, and, um, so it it's becomes, it's about equilibrium between the two. So you say, well, you know, why do we have saponification versus transesterification? Well, in theory, you know, you've got a lot of methanol, right? You know, it should be you know, a little bit of water, you know, no big deal, right? Uh, however, it's also kind of about a competition between these things. So if you look at, this is hydroxide, this is methoxide, this is ethoxide, right? So they kind of get progressively larger. So these things have to get inside kind of the, the vegetable oil molecule and attack that bond. Well, this guy is a lot smaller. He can get in there a lot easier. So this is way more competitive. The hydroxide is way more competitive than the methoxide at reacting with the vegetable oil. So you don't really need that much water to, to get a lot of you know, soap formation, a lot of free fatty acid and therefore soap instead of um, methyl ester. The problem with that is, is like I said, once you have free fatty acid, it's kind of, you know, it's, um, In one second, just, just to be clear, there would be some cool reasons you might want to use an epoxide, and I'm not sure anybody would know those. So, uh, why would you use an epoxide? Oh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I put this up here as kind of an aside because a lot of people use methanol, but I wanted to make it clear, like, if you've ever tried to make biodiesel from ethanol, which is, you know, ethanol is, is typically more associated with biofuels, you know, like corn-based ethanol or there's other, you know, things that, you know, it's kind of also a biofuel, so a lot of people are like, well, we make biodiesel with ethanol. It's possible, but it's very, very, very sensitive to water content. And the other problem with that is it's very hard to get you know, all the water out of the ethanol. So, I mean, I've, I've never been really successful in making ethanol, but I've tried, you know, in the lab, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. Is there like a sodium ethylate as well as a sodium methylate? Um, I don't know. I've never seen it on the market. Um, Made from plant-based ethanol? There, there very might well be, but that's kind of another story that I'm not going to get into too much because you can get anhydrous you know, sodium methoxide, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, you can't really make it yourself. I think it's very dangerous to make. Um, you can't order it. And by doing that, you can eliminate a lot of these problems. Um, but, you know, like I said, I wanted to kind of keep it, you know, from the, the common approach that I think most people are doing. No, I just want to talk about ethyl esters. Another cool thing about ethyl esters is you hear biodiesel and ethyl esters tax rubber and all kinds of things. So some other applications that you can use an ethyl ester for that you may not be able to use uh, right. a methyl ester. Yeah. It's right. Okay. It's I believe they do have lower. Really really I believe they have lower melting points too, usually. So, so there's some advantages doing that, but it's just more difficult because of the structure and, and, and everything I'm talking about with how the reaction works. So, um, again, back in water, you know, water is kind of 
you know, to reiterate, water, the more water you have, the more hydroxide you're going to have instead of methoxide. And like I said, it doesn't really take that much to really throw the, the, the reaction off. You know, it can, you know, water ends up in fry oil because of the food. That water can hydrolyze the triglycerides to make free fatty acids, and then you have to add more catalysts, which adds again more water. So that's kind of, you know, why we get to, you know, people say, oh, you know, I don't work with oil that, you know, doesn't titrate under this certain level. Well, there's a very good reason for that because, you know, the, the standard process that, you know, a lot of us learn and probably utilize is very, it's limited. You know, you have to have a feedstock that sort of meets a certain requirement. You know, you can't just make up for it with these processes. You have to get into more advanced processing if you want to deal with uh, high water, high free fatty acid. Um, well, and that's, I mean, you guys probably already know that, you know, so, yeah. Is the average titration limit then? That you can do standard uh, I think that's a matter of opinion, really. I was already here, I'm just saying about there's some sort of a... Um, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. I, I think a lot of people you talk to will give you a different answer, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, when you can tolerate loss. Yeah. Because yeah. that product can restore your loss. So from a commercial perspective, we just yeah. focus on whether we're going to get from the application loss, what we, what we think we're going to get. So that's what determines our, our maximum amount. So it's your process will sort of determine right. what kinds of feed stocks you can get to the And your tolerance for loss of that product is still determined. Cool. All right, let me, uh, I'm almost done, so we can have a little discussion. Let me just kind of get through these last few points. Um, so a few notes on post-processing that are kind of related. So glycerol is pretty really <coughs> dense, and it's quite polar. It tends to carry most of the catalyst, the excess methanol, water, with it during the separation process. So that's when you kind of let it settle and you get that layer in the bottom that you decant off. Uh, however, it's important to realize a little bit of all those things still remain in the diesel, and that's why we wash it again you know, with a water wash process. And so we can use water to remove that, uh, but it is problematic due to emulsion formation because of the soaps. Uh, so, you know, that's why, one of the reasons why softened water helps, or if you've ever tried to use some sort of an acid to kind of break an emulsion. Well, that's kind of like, you know, look at this, this reaction here. Soap is just a salt. So if we can make a different salt by, for example, the addition of, you know, we put hydrochloric acid in there, which is a very strong acid. Now, this is going to have a tendency to grab that sodium ion away from the, from the soap and leave it as a free fatty acid and salt. So, you know, and, and that's, you know, it's very clear. I mean, I've, I've seen emulsions sit for days and, you know, you mix some citric acid or hydrochloric acid water in there, it's gone, you know. But it's important to recognize that that's going to leave free fatty acid behind in your fuel. You know, you're shifting the equilibrium back towards free fatty acid, which are going to stay in the, in the mostly non-polar fraction, which is the biodiesel. The polar stuff, you know, the salts and the methanol are going to come out with the water. So. Um, and if you guys are familiar with the ASTM standard, that's going to increase the acid number of the fuel. And so what's, what's the logical way to get rid of that FFA after you've done that? Is it just a matter of blending it down with good stuff till it's... Well, I, I, I think, I mean, I, I mean, Lyle mentioned that earlier, that that's one way they deal with that. Uh, there are things you can do about it, but I don't really have time to go into it right now. That's kind of more into, uh, you know, like I said, the more fancy processing, so... Um, Okay, so yeah, in summary, you know, understanding a little bit of the chemistry behind basic bodies of production hopefully will, you know, give you some insight on how to make a better fuel. Um, a lot of this I know is probably, you know, makes sense, you know, it should make sense, you know, if you're familiar with the process and, you know, but you're really, you know, for the low-tech solution, you know, there's no substitute for, you know, good oil that's relatively low water, low in free fatty acid, because both of those things, um, you know, tend to, you know, they will lead to excessive soap production, which is not what you want. So, that's pretty much it. Is there any questions? Uh, open the discussion here. Yes? Earlier you were talking about, like, water's the enemy. Yeah. And in the, um, the mixture of um, your, your alkali with methanol, you, you produce water, so you're adding water in, in addition to whatever's in the oil. Mm -hmm. How difficult do you think, and this is open to the class, do you think it is to take, you know, uh, potassium, metal, and methanol in a kind of a strong container and, and make methoxide directly? 
Um, well, that's a good point. I, I did mention that because you can buy anhydrous sodium methoxide. I don't know if you can get potassium methoxide. I've, I've looked around for it and never found it. Um, the thing about that is you have to, you know, if you take sodium metal, right, and add it directly to methanol, you can end up with um, just, you know, the sodium ions and the methoxide ions, right? Okay, well, if you think about what would happen there is in order for the methanol to associate with the sodium, it's got to boot off the hydrogen, right? I'm pretty sure that that reaction produces hydrogen gas, so, which is highly explosive. So I think it's a, I, I wouldn't try it at home, um, you know, but I think one thing that people have discussed, uh, or I certainly have been around discussion of it, is going to an industrial chemical supplier, buying a barrel of, you know, 5% sodium methylate, or, you know, what I think is the commercial term for it, um, and then just mixing that in with your methanol as a catalyst instead of using the dry catalyst. So, you know, that's certainly an option. I, I don't, I can't speak for making it. Uh, I, I, my understanding is it's, it's pretty dangerous. It probably should be left to a chemical facility. So. Uh, one of the things that I think would be interesting in looking at that is the life cycle analysis of the energy it takes to make sodium metal though, as opposed yeah. to sodium hydroxide, which can take less energy right. to produce than a pure sodium metal. It's yeah, that, energy that, intensive. Yeah, that's another factor too. I mean, sodium, you don't just see sodium metal hanging out on planet Earth, you know? It's, just, it's always associated with something else. It's extremely reactive. It's ready to go. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's, a, that's certainly a valid point. Um, so, uh, you put up the recipe there, vegetable oil, and then you uh, that it's gonna encourage soap formation. So I think there will be a difference there, yeah. but it's, since it's kind of, um, you know, everything is in excess, yeah, I, 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 I would think that that's something that experience, you know, it's worth, it might be worth playing around with and see what kind of results you get, but I can't speak for exactly, you know, this, 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 or that. I think that's yeah. something that, you know, is yeah. a valid point to. The thing the reason I ask is because uh, when I just use a vegetable oil out of the supermarket mm -hmm. and whatever's in there, or some buffer, whatever. And I use that standard recipe, I get a pretty good biodiesel. Well, it's pretty good oil. Right. Oh, yeah. It's right. even oil, right? So, yeah. um, but when I try with coconut oil, the, I tried it in the South Pacific mm -hmm. with locally produced coconut oil, mm -hmm. and it went to soap. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, oh, you know, too much sodium hydroxide in that recipe. Right. Now, as I listen to you, it maybe there was water in that. There might have been, yeah. Right, in the water uh, well, what kind of, I mean, did you get refined, bleached, deodorized coconut oil? No, this, this, was, this would have been produced in the uh, planting method where you take coconut cream and you heat it over a, a fire until the, the water is 
taken off. Oh, okay. So I didn't produce it. So there may have been water in it. Okay. But about six years ago, I, I traveled down to Seattle and I took a day course with Lyle. Right. And I brought with me some good quality coconut oil. We made coconut diesel. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember us doing anything different. Mm -hmm. You know, we titrated. Mm -hmm. But I can't remember that there was anything else different than just a vegetable oil. So, right. I think another fact, well, you could be right. It could have been, you might not have gotten all the water out of it. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised how much water is in, especially, you know, if you're using waste vegetable oil. Have you guys ever done like the water test? You put a little bit of a pan and wait for it to stop bubbling, or it takes a while. <laughs> and you're like, even you know, a lot of times you, you know the quick test is you know well, how clear is it? You know, if it's really cloudy, it usually means more water. But even really clear oil, sometimes you can have a lot of water come out of it. But the other factor is if you're using what we call a crude oil, like if you're just taking the coconut milk, and you know, there's a lot of other stuff in plant oils other than just triglycerides. Now, when you buy supermarket oil, uh, that's what we call, you know, RBD, refined, bleached, and deodorized. It's been refined to get certain stuff out, bleached to take other stuff out, deodorized to take other stuff out. So it's a very refined product. And used frying oil is derived from that product. But when you go back to the plant itself, there's other things. There's things called phospholipids. There's 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 all this other stuff that is not a saponifiable material that may react with the lye itself in completely different ways. So uh, that may be a factor as well. Yeah. But, but the basic recipe I should stick with. Yeah, the basic yeah. recipe, but I think, you know, if, you, know, you know, the basic recipe I think was developed by people working with, you know, refined oils in the United States. So if you're going in, you know, some other place, you know, we don't have a lot of coconut oil here. So it's kind of, if you're doing that, you know, you may need to, um, you know, dig into the chemistry a little more, find out what's really in there and maybe do some experimentation. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, is it, I'm wondering if it's possible to, that it's due to the degree of saturation of the oil itself. More saturation, more hydrogen, oh. atoms, more, more um, potential to create water to lead to saponification. That brings up a different, a good point that I was gonna mention if I forgot. Um, I'm not sure about the saturation, but palmitic oil, I think is a 14 carbon or 16 carbon, it's really short. So there's not near, it's a, very, it's a much shorter molecule. So uh, again, getting back to the molecular weight, same amount of mass would have more, um, you know, more triglycerides. So that may that may be a factor as well. Mm -hmm. You know, different molecular weights. Yeah. Okay, recipe question. So basically, uh, you do titration of oil and then you add the base. So for KOHs or seed ranges, and people use the base cows from seven to ten mm -hmm. uh, grams mm -hmm. per year. What with that range, how much does that mess around with the soap production? Like, uh, like I said, it's in your tent, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, I guess right. I don't really know, maybe they can take a survey of what people use right. as a base. Yeah, so, I, so I, starting point. I think again, you know, that gets back to kind of the experimentation because if you're using KOH, which is potassium hydroxide, mm -hmm. the more you add, the more hydroxide you're adding to the mix. And that's going to, that it leads down the path to making free fatty acids and then soap. The less catalyst you add, you know, then there's, you know, there's less hydroxide, but there's also less methoxide to do. I think so what you know what some people have done is you know you can if you use less catalyst you may be able to still get the reaction done but you have to wait longer because it's just going to proceed much slower because there's less of those active compounds and I think that's really you know um, in the years that I've been you know involved with biodiesel I've seen that change you know it's sort of like kind of um, you know maybe a long time ago you said oh this use this amount then years later said no we're all using this amount now and it's just I think that's just kind of something that comes out of experimentation and, and you know, which is really gets back to why I like to do this talk because, you know, um, a lot of the stuff in making biodiesel, it's, it's not cut and dry. It's a little bit like baking or, you know, there's a little bit of a, you know, there's a recipe. It's like, why do we use 100% excess methanol? Why don't we use 200%? You know, more methanol the better, right? Well, that gets into problems because that's going to mix more with the glycerol, which is going to change the density of that fraction and you may not get as good of a separation. So there's all kinds of th different things that interact. And so, you know, I think really, um, I was very much drawn to understanding the chemistry of bodies when I got into it because I started realizing these things. And, um, you know, it's, it's especially since biodiesel is very difficult to, to test, you know. You know, there might be, you know, I know I remember when the 327 test came out, I was like, oh, that's a really cool thing people came up with. When I first started making biodiesel, 
that, didn't, that test didn't exist. So I kind of really had to trust my process. I, had to, I felt like the best way to get good fuel is to really understand the chemistry and try and get the theory and try and set up a good reaction because, you know, unless you've got a GC, you know, you're kind of just, you get what you get. There's no way to really look at what's really in there. So. Yeah, I'd like to go back to Pete's first question and try and throw this out uh, to some of the, you know, the brain trust here again. Like, uh, just about what, uh, I guess, a free fatty acid content or a titration value where people tend to not proceed with using that oil unless they do an acid free treat or, or something like that. So what is, I'd like to kind of throw it out. Yeah, it's pull the room, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah, find out what, what cutoff point you use. And maybe that, that's a good indication of like, people who don't want to do the acid free treat. Maybe they'll start running out of soap under that high FSA oil. Well, I think, um, sorry. I'm no, no, I'm not jump in. Right. For a couple things, I mean, um, we, we've just adopted a bunch of other approaches because acid sterification is one of those things that um, it's expensive and creates some byproducts that are expensive for us to get rid of, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we've done everything from trying to use glycerin and washing and stuff at higher temperatures. Uh, but I think it's sort of plant specific, and that's really the problem that we have. We have a pressure vessel, and so uh, we can take stuff up to about 600 degrees at 200 psi. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's our max. And so, uh, from our perspective, there's certain, but we don't want to do that all the time because obviously there's an energy sacrifice. It's, it's a few months we, we pay for. It. We pay for our electricity, we pay for our gas. And so we don't do that all the time. And we don't do that very often. But with a high pressure, we'll do maybe 14 if the feedstock was low cost. I mean, if we collected it ourselves or something like that. But if we have to buy feedstock, then we can't take that kind of loss. And so it really is highly, from even from our perspective, it's highly, highly variable. I think if you get the same the same response for the plant. There's a part of this where we take a base formula, and we, that's really just the stat. It's our, it's our best guesstimate of what's going on with the fuel, or what's going to happen. And then, when uh, we're done with what we think is, should be broken, uh, we test it. We see how far away we are um, from not only reaction completion, but from the yield that we expect to get. And we also look at it again at the bank. We have a magic number sometimes. We have 0.65. So we'll take stuff up to 300 degrees, which is much higher than normal. Right? Most of the plants are operating between 120 and 180. Maybe some of them are going 220, 225. Um, and, uh, but at certain temperatures and certain pressures, we get different kinds of uh, not known results because we're not that good yet, but expected. Like there are numbers that we see. And they're the numbers that, oh, okay, we've seen this number before. I mean, it's like 0.65 at the bank right. and a magic number for our bottom. Right, That's yeah. I, th I think it's really important to know that it, it kind of depends on the situation because uh, the you know, commercial plants that I've talked to and even the you know, home brewers I've talked to that have a very you know, consistent, you know, they make bodies every week, it's, it's kind of a different thing. You know, they sort of, you know, after what their process is, what their processor and their, you know, feedstock that they get, you know, it's consistent. It's typically you kind of lock into something that just really works very well for you. May not necessarily be the same for everybody else. But on that same note, I think it's important to note that, you know, KOH versus NaOH, sodium versus potassium, they're going to titrate differently too because they have a different molecular weight, sodium and, and potassium. So, and because you're measuring, and typically you measure it by weight, measure mass and you mix that in and make your standardized solution, well that's not the same molar solution. They're not the same number of atoms of sodium versus potassium. But since these reactions happen per atom basis, you know, you're going to get different numbers. So that's I important. I think we've got time for maybe one more quick question or comment and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Sure. There is one. I think it always helps to do a test batch. I think Graydon's going to do a, a demonstration of that oh, too. Yeah. And for homebrewers who are just starting, it always helps to do a one liter if you got a whole bunch of stuff and yeah. kind of something weird about it. Oh yeah, so and, and, nice. and continuously too. You know, like uh, you know, um, you know, there was a mention of Bob Ar Armitage earlier. Well, he used to be in Colorado, and and I had a really close relationship with him when he used to actually run a biodiesel plant in Berkeley, Colorado, and. 
you know, I talked to him about his process. And they, you know, part of their standard <coughs> weekly procedure was making test batches. They would get stuff, they'd always be just playing around with it, trying different things, you know, because, and that's just, you know, because st stuff changes, you know, feedstock changes. It's always good to just actually make a small batch of fuel and see what happens. One more. Yeah. What side should I err on? Should I err on the side of underdosing as a call to make, or should I just be brave? That depends on your client. Uh, <laughs> who, are, who are you selling it to? You know, uh, and uh, yeah, um, I don't. That's a complicated question. That really is, unfortunately. So I think we're out of time. Yeah.